So, good morning and welcome. And um, hey, thank you everyone for turning up on a Saturday morning. Um, I really, we really appreciate this. And we're here today to discuss a really important theme, 21st century feminism in the academy. And I want to begin by doing, of course, some thank, some thank yous. And I would like to start by thanking the Royal Society of Canada, uh, in the particular Constance Backhouse, who is chair of the Equity and Diversity Committee of the Royal Society. And she's the one who invited us to run a taboo topics forum for the Royal Society. I'd also like to thank the President's Office for actually for also funding this event with along with the Royal Society. I am Helen Fielding, Chair of Women's Studies and Feminist Research, which is spearheaded the organization of this forum. Kathleen Okalik, Bonnie McLaughlin, Jessica Poulter, and Natasha Barua are also on the committee and helped um, organize this event. I'd also like to thank the Women's Studies and Feminist Research staff, Betty Thompson and Alicia McIntyre, who have been absolutely amazing with their attention to detail, and who are actually um, offered to be here today for this event. And as well, of course, um, Jacob Bevoy for organizing the graduate student and undergraduate student volunteers, 13 of them, and for all my colleagues as well, in, and graduate students in Women's Studies for their support. It's been quite amazing. Finally, I would also like to thank our wonderful speakers who are here today, uh, who are so enthusiastic about this event. And in particular, I want to thank Joanne St. Louis, who agreed to step in at the very last minute into Diane Majuri's place. Uh, Dr. Majuri's partner died Thursday night after a long illness. So, um, to begin our event, um, I am very pleased to be able to introduce Janice Deacon, Western's Provost and Vice President Academic. And she's here to share a few words with us. So I, I'd also really appreciate Dr. Deacon's commitment to being here today. So let me briefly provide some background. Dr. Deacon's PhD is in kinesiology from the University of Waterloo. And she is one of Canada's foremost researchers in evaluating the determinants of expert performance in sports, including figure skating, martial arts, basketball, and volleyball. She has published extensively within her field. She was the first woman to receive an officiating license from the world's governing body for basketball. Indeed, she was the first woman to officiate an Olympic medal game, the Women's Bronze Medal Game at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. She has, in addition, served as president of the Canadian Society for Psycho Psychomotor Learning and Sports Psychology, president of the Canadian Council of University Physical Education and Kinesiology Administrators, Vice Chair of the Ontario Council of Graduate Schools, and she is also a member of the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities Joint Task Force on Graduate Expansion. She comes to Western from Queen's University, where she was Associate Vice Principal and Dean of Graduate Studies. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Deacon. Thank you, Helen, and I hate all that stuff. I think you should just get rid of it, but of course it is, you know, it's funny and all these things, when everybody asks me what I do and people talk about my avocation, it started as a graduate student in basketball referee because I had played as, a, as an undergraduate at Queen's and people are far more impressed with that than anything else and it was a lot of fun. Uh, listen, uh, thank you for inviting me here this morning and thank you all for being here this morning. We're uh, very excited to have been involved in this uh, in, in, in uh, this event and its planning and certainly Helen and, and, and uh, uh, her, her team um, took up the, uh, uh, the opportunity and the challenge and so uh, th thank you all very much for, for being here. Um, I, just a few words I, I guess. I, I think I want to start by saying um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of, of the way Western has moved with respect to its representation of women on, on faculty. Um, I've been at three universities, Waterloo, which at the time had the lowest representation of women on faculty in the 80s when I was a PhD student there. I took my first position at Queen's in 1986. I went to the university with the second lowest proportion of women on faculty. Um, and we did a lot of work at Queen's uh, uh, to, to, to change that. And then my next move, 25 years later, was uh, to Western. And I was really quite surprised when I came here to see that Western uh, really was behind uh, 
the, the curve, the, the, the uh, national average on, on proportion of women, and yet very impressed with the work that Alan Whedon and faculty relations and uh, colleagues uh, through Senate have uh, put policies and practices in place to see more and more women. And you know, at the assistant level, I would just tell you we, we have uh, uh, the appropriate representation, just I, I think it's about 48% uh, uh, women at the assistant level. We still have work to do, of course, at the, at the associate and, and, and full. And of course, that does take time because it is a pipeline, uh, a pipeline um, uh, sort of ad adventure as well as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, going out and, and hiring good uh, mid-career uh, women, and we're committed to that as, as well. But it seems to me that, that this topic and you all here to discuss it is very important because what I, I know, not at all being a scholar in this area, is that there is this is sort of insidious uh, uh, bias. There's a, there's a notion of with many young women, in, young women and men in society today that you know we don't need to think about fem feminism anymore. It's all done. Everybody's equal, and what's the big deal? And, and I guess uh, that makes it more insidious. It makes the discussion more important because if people think um, that that uh, all uh, biases are are uh, visible biases are are, are uh, finished with, are over. Uh, yet there is sort of systemic. Uh, biases that are that that are in uh, sometimes in higher hiring practices, but but perhaps just even in in, in uh, people's points of view. And I think that having a conference like this and having so many engaged people is very important because we have to be able to speak in ways that don't threaten people, but that enlighten uh, young women and men uh, today. That uh, we have lots of work uh, to continue to do to ensure that that uh, women are are uh, fully represented in all the hallways. I'm, I'm sure none of it's lost on you the discussion on CBC over the last few weeks, the Women's Pension Fund, uh, the Ontario Pension Fund, uh, actually uh, putting a line in the sand suggesting that we should have at least three women directors on all boards of directors of, of, uh, of uh, publicly traded com companies in Canada. Of course, you would all know, I expect, that representation of, of women in the highest level of boards is abysmally poor. Um, you know, it reminds me when I went to Queen's when people said, uh, the very caring, mostly older men who said, you know, we don't actually need policies because, you know, we're all on top of this now and we're all doing our best. And I think they all believe that. Uh, but just leaving it up to uh, the dominant group doing their best, uh, somebody else is going to be standing up here in 50 years talking about the same thing. So anyway, I haven't paid any attention to any of my notes um, that were so nicely prepared for me. Um, so I guess I should, I will finish by just uh, saying a couple of things. I too want to thank the Royal Society uh, and, Can and uh, Constance when she approached us. Uh, Alan and, and I had the first discussion of, of course, uh, uh, we, we discussed it with my friend here at the front, what do you think about this? And, and we were excited to be able to be involved with the, uh, with the Royal Society. We're working hard at Western to nominate our faculty. We have many good faculty who should be uh, members of the Royal Society, many more than, 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 we, than we have. And we, through the VP Research's office and my office, are trying to help our faculty colleagues in identifying and helping with what's a fairly arduous uh, nomination process, but it's well worth it. And so this morning, of course, Professor Jeremy O'Neill is here, uh, sir, McNeil is here, and he is one of our, uh, our Royal Society members who I get to see every morning at about 7.30 when I go over to Einstein's for a coffee. Uh, he is uh, he's, uh, uh, the Battle Visiting Professor in Chemical Ecology. He's with us today, and uh, somebody thought I got off, got off a plane to be here. I didn't. I'm on a plane on Monday, but Jeremy is on and off planes. Uh, he is an eminent scholar. He is all over the world, but what impresses me most about Jeremy is when I see him, the first thing he talks about is the preparation of his lectures and the students and the classes that he's teaching. And that's what makes him special, it's what makes Western special, that we can have this wonderful and important combination of, of outstanding world-class scholars who are so committed to teaching and, and, uh, and learning, and Jeremy is certainly an exemplar of that. So I'll close by saying again, Helen, thank you for uh, sharing this and for doing this work, you and your colleagues who you thanked. I wish you all the best uh, for your conference today and, uh, and best wishes for uh, the remainder of the term and the school year to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would now like to introduce, actually, Dr. Jeremy 
McNeil, who is the Helen I. Dapple Visiting Professor in the Department of Biology here at Western. And Dr. McNeil is speaking to us today on behalf, as the, the stand speaker pointed out, on behalf of the Royal Society of Canada, of which he is a member. Uh, Dr. McNeil is actually he's, he's an eminent scholar in his field. He not only researches the reproductive strategies of migrating insects from a multidisciplinary perspective, considering both behavioral and ecological aspects. He also shares his expertise giving presentations to children as well as public institutions such as the Ontario Science Centre. He also appears regularly on the radio and television, both locally and nationally. And of course, he's here with us today to, again, share. Um, currently, he's involved in a study on the monarch butterfly, and I loved this, so I, I had to add, add this. Um, He's addressing the question, how do they know, how did the, the monarch butterfly know how to stop or when to stop on the southward fall of migration to Mexico? So if you get a chance, perhaps at the break, you might ask him that question. <laughs> so please. <laughs> Merci, Helen. C'est un plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui uh, pour représenter la Société Royale du Canada. I have now done my duty for one part of the country. <laughs> so I will ask that. Actually, it's no problem. I can do it in French because I only, I'm an old, young professor here, or old, new professor here, uh, because I was 30 years at Laval University, so I actually gave all my lectures in French. Um, I would like to say um, a word on behalf of the President of the Royal Society of Canada, Yolande Griset, who would like to have been here today, but unfortunately could not, uh, for other commitments, and also for my friend uh, Constant Backhouse, who had obviously wanted to be here, was an organizer of this event, and for personal reasons could not come, and at the last minute asked me, would I step in? I apologize for being an old silverback, gray-haired representative of the Royal Society, but unfortunately because of the pipeline, this is what happens with more of the senior members. Um, this is going to change. Um, Two years ago, Constance was the chair of the Standing Committee of Equity and Diversity in the Royal Society. They deposed a report, and Francis Henry, who was one of the speakers, was on that committee. Uh, the report was um, uh, presented to the executive and the board two years ago. It had 27 recommendations, which I am glad to say that have been incorporated into the new five-year plan, strategic plan, which started this year. A number of them are rather minor, um, in the sense of rather easy to do, and we can do it immediately. And one I would announce that is going to be officially announced next week is some of you may know that Alice Wilson, there's an Alice Wilson Award. Alice Wilson was the first woman named to the Royal Society of Canada, unfortunately not very long ago given how old the society is. But there is an award given out for the for outstanding research by a female postdoctorate student. And it used to be given out every year, but once in the arts, once in the social sciences, once in the sciences. So any given discipline would only be recognized once every three years. As of this year, it will be given out, there will be three a year, one in each of the academies. So in this way, we will look forward to getting nominations from different people. It was also said that we are underrepresented both with women, French Canadians, um, indigenous uh, groups. We are, and we're working hard to change that. But one thing that does happen, and Janice made reference to it, you cannot get somebody nominated or elected if you do not nominate them. And we have a rather sad record in many cases. Oh, it's too difficult. And Janice is quite right, it is an onerous damn project, because I've done it for two people um, in my own department. But it is important, if there are people you really believe in, get together, go and find suitable fellows that will not necessarily hear elsewhere, it doesn't matter, and get candidates nominated. Another thing that's going to happen, which will be extremely important in my mind, is the fact that we are now going to have the, um, oh, it's a very long, I'll just say the Young Academy, because we realize that people get elected at the sort of the second half of their career. And obviously, because of the pipeline, a large number, it's disproportionate male. 
but we are now going to have an academy of young artists, scientists um, that will be starting next year. Each university gets the opportunity to nominate a certain number of people, and we are informing all of them that we expect excellence, obviously, but we will be expecting proper nominations in gender and in all other aspects they consider. And it's not just going, we want to support this one. So please be active in this, and after several years when we have a college, then there will be a nomination process that doesn't involve the universities directly. It will be people nominating to the committees that will be made up. We haven't got the committees because we haven't gotten a college yet, but it will be happening. The last thing I'd like to say is you might wonder about the taboo topics itself. Um, this came out from a former president, which was Gilles Paquet, who, who felt that we should be, on an institutional level, we should be a public intellectual. And we should be the ones driving meetings like this, whereby topics which should be discussed, and should be discussed properly in public in an intelligent way, could actually happen. And I think today's topic is uh, first rate. Gilles is very happy that it happened. And so on behalf of the society, I think, everybody for the local people organizing Western for the support for actually doing this and I wish you great success not only for today but in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Camille. So now we will begin our event and our, first I would like to introduce our first moderator of the day uh, Bonnie McLaughlin. Bonnie is a professor emerita of the Department of Classics here at Western University. So, please. Oh, she, I'd also like to add, she's also the um, chair of the Women's Caucus at Western. Good morning and welcome. We're launching this important event for the presentation on a topic that has for a long time been one of deep concern to feminists. The participation of women in the academy in the field of science. Carla Fair has been a change agent in this field for some time. As a philosopher of science, she is dedicated to making this area of study socially relevant. Focusing on the philosophy of biology, ecology, and feminist epistemology, with a determination to demonstrate the point that diversity among its <coughs> participants promotes excellence. Her interdisciplinary work includes, as she makes clear on her website, the epistemology of ignorance, an investigation into why smart people of goodwill Re resist acknowledging how race, gender, and other social categories structure both our knowledge-producing institutions and that knowledge they produce. Dr. Fair received her PhD at Duke University and taught at Iowa State University before coming to the University of Waterloo <clears throat> as the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Techno Technological Literacy. A dedicated teacher, she has won several teaching awards. She has published widely on the evolution of sex and pluralism in biology, and on the impact made by feminism in scientific exploration. She is a founder of the American Philosophical Association's Site Visit Program, dedicated to improving the climate for women philosophers across North America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carla Fair, who will give us a presentation entitled, Excellent Science, of the People, by the People, for the people. Carla Fair. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this great event. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm so happy to be at the University of Waterloo. And one of the reasons is it's so close to here. <laughs> in 1863, at the site of one of the bloodiest battles in the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg Address, in which he resolved that this name, it is phrase that's become iconic. This nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, 
and the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. On one hand, these words have become um, an iconic, and have become in the popular imagination of many people, an iconic statement of democracy. And, have, and there are many themes that we can pull out of this. So I kind of take about democracy and about what we think of as being good about democracy. And so people pull out themes of inclusion, of participation, representation, and because of um, participation, representation, a government that's accountable to the people. <clears throat> On the other hand, a very different question arises when we ask, when, or a different way of thinking arises when we pointedly ask, who is included when we, who is included in that phrase, the people? And one of the things become, that becomes apparent if when we ask that question is that most of us in this room at that time would not fall under that heading. So most of us under, in this room, um, white women, uh, men and women of color, including importantly African Americans and members of, um, uh, members of American Indian tribes, would not enjoy the confidence that comes from knowing that their government is um, for us because it's by us. This tension that arises when we attend to the actual challenges of inclusion and how those issues of inclusion influence the excellence of our, of our institutions, um, and in this case today our universities, is what motivates my thinking about the lecture for today. So there has been recently um, a strong push and a strong focus in scholarship that's leading us to think about the relationships between um, our scientific institutions and democracy. And um, what we see here is people who are strongly trying to focus our attention on the importance of a scientifically and technologically literate society. Thank heavens for some of those people because they let me move back to Canada to take my job, um, as well as other good things. Um, people focusing on the importance of scientifically informed policymakers and scientifically motivated public policy. There's been a lot of work in philosophy of science on the, democra on the democratic governance of science, whether this be the choice of our research programs, what direction does our scientific research go in, and also along the lines of, of what are the um, expenditures for public funds. <coughs> and of course issues of who gets to be not only the participant and who gets to be the decision makers when it comes to making these sorts of decisions. Also we have people working on issues of citizen um, and stakeholder science and scientific uh, people who are members of scientific advisory boards. We can see this not only in scholarship but also in the growth of institutions. So for example, the um, Skip some slides here. The Union of Concerned Scientists has developed a center for science and democracy, and part of their mission includes strengthening American democracy by advancing the essential role of sciences, evidence-based decision-making, and constructive debate as a means for improving the health, security, and prosper prosperity of all people. But there again, we have this notion of all people, what's going on there. The uh, Science and Democracy Network at, the, um, Harvard, at Harvard's Kennedy School also focuses on these things, and when we look to their mission statement, we see including points that talk about, I need to read this, and I already have talked about my glasses, so there's some in the room. Uh, support for international network of scholars and practitioners interested in the democratic governments in science and technology, so significant focus there. Also, uh, their job is to promote scholarly exploration of democratic design, steering, conduct, and use of science and technology, and also the focus of science and technology research on and for policy actors and policy makers. So we see that there is a lot of discussion on the, inter on the relationship between science and democracy, but here's something we see less discussion of, which shouldn't be so surprising now, in terms of who, what kinds of people are included in those communities of experts, and who are the knowledge, produ the knowledge producers, not simply the knowledge consumers. And also the question, another way of putting this right this to my theme, who is our science by, and from that, who can we think of our science being for? So if we think about the notion of science as a public institution, and here I'm particularly focusing on universities, as being uh, for, by the people and for the people. Who is it that we can turn to to ask those questions? And there are useful resources that we can find from people doing work in feminist science studies, feminist philosophy of science, and feminist epistemology. It ends up our philosophers have something to say about these kinds of questions. <clears throat> 
And so when we, and the questions, the questions that these fields have really cut their teeth on are issues of inclusion, of representation, participation, and accountability. These things come up over and over again. And so we can specifically ask, we can specifically ask the question, who is included and who is excluded by a variety of different kinds of barriers um, from fully participating in the community of experts that exists in our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics research communities, in our departments, in our universities. And also we can ask the question, so why do these patterns of inclusion and exclusion matter? There's an obvious question that comes, or an obvious answer that comes up here in many of our minds, issues of justice, right, issues of employment equity. But also what I've been focusing on in my research these days is that in order for our research, in order for our scientific research to do the work that we need to do, in order for it to be excellent. And of course, that's the catchphrase that we all hear when we're talking about hiring, right? We want excellence, we want a star. But in order, and in order for us to do that, um, paying attention to issues of inclusion uh, and, and exclusion of who gets to be members of these communities is an important kind of question. So I'm particularly interested in the representation of women in, in STEM communities. Um, and what's interesting, we'll talk about this a little while later, but, it, but women across the spectrum, so women, <coughs> women, women of color, uh, women from a variety of different kinds of groups. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at statistics. I'm just going to describe some patterns for you to get to move us forward. But one of the things that we found is that there's been, as we know, there's been an incredible increase of women in our undergraduate um, pools, and particularly in some various fields. But we have not seen proportional increases in um, these, these increases in women students have not led to proportional increases of women professors. These things vary by discipline. It's important to know we can't, it's very difficult to talk about the sciences in general. So if we look to the biological sciences, we see a lot of representation. If we look to some fields in particular, like physics, computer science, mathematics, engineering, philosophy, religious studies, right? In these kinds of fields, I threw in thought, they're not STEM disciplines, but I can't help but say that. Um, we see that we're particularly behind the curve. Uh, we find that attrition rates are higher among women faculty members than men faculty members. One institution I looked at, the administrators thought we're fine here, because if we look at who gets tenure, it's proportionally is the same. But then we did an analysis to look at who left before tenure, right? And we found significantly higher attrition rates uh, of women before they came up for tenure than men. And oftentimes what happens is you have women being taken out of these competitions before the competition happens, and that hides their, uh, their disappearance from a lot of the metrics that we use to understand uh, what's going on in our communities. Um, women faculty members tend to be concentrated in less prestigious institutions, at lower ranks, and at less secure positions. So if you want to find the most equitable places in the university, you, want to, you should look to our lectureships, our lecture positions, our adjunct faculty. Um, and one of the things that I think is very important is there is a relative absence of women in senior and leadership positions. And so every time there is a woman provost or a woman dean or a woman to senior faculty member who steps up to these issues, the amount of of um, thanks that we need to give to that person is high because their resources are stretched thinner than many other uh, people in those positions. And of course, one of the things that happens is when we focus on women and we look at diversity on women, we see a near absence of women of color, uh, especially in our science and engineering, um, mathematics, and uh, science, mathematics, engineering, and technology disciplines. Uh, and that's something that's really striking because that absence makes it actually very difficult to study. So one of the, just an anecdote about that, uh, uh, one of the institutions that I've worked with, we wanted to look at why are there so few many black women, and part of the issue then became because of the constraints of our IRB, our institutional review board program, we couldn't say anything about the African American women, and the reason why is it was important to, that research subjects from an ethics perspective remain anonymous, and if I were to talk to you about the black women in our the black women in our natural sciences program, you could look on the website and find out who she was. Right? And so these kinds of situations create a very problem, very problematic case because who is it that we study and is challenging, especially from a social science perspective, to study absence. Um, this is something that has become, so I've studied this in the American context, it's something that we've had to deal with in Canada as well. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the patterns, the, uh, the employment patterns in Canada and the states tend to be very similar. There are some very particular Canadian institutions uh, where we see these things raising their head. So I'm not sure if you know about the Canadian Research, well of course you know about the Canadian Research Chair Program, but initially this program started, it fits our theme, started in the year 2000, just sneaked in. Um, and that Research Chairs Program spends about um, $300 million a year uh, supporting 
excellent researchers uh, from across the disciplines and across the countries. We found out in the first year of that program, only 14% of the chairs were women. There was a group of women then who raised a human rights complaint in 2003. Uh, that complaint was resolved in 2006, and, in 2000, and the settlement of that complaint was a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing because one of the things that happened there is the federal, is, as a part of that settlement, uh, federal government policies on non-discrimination, employment equity became part of the process. And so now if we look at the, uh, how these chairs, how the uh, searches for these chairs are structured, they use a lot of best practices that, can, that arise out of a program that I'll talk about in a little while. Um, but then we can talk about Canadian, oh, and the, of course I, I left off the success part of this. If we look at what happened along the road in 2012 when we represented 25.6, uh, I don't know who that small woman is there, but um, of, the, of the research chairs. Canadian Excellence in Research Chairs is another, is another story. I was in the States working on issues of equity in STEM, and I realized that I had very rose-colored glasses. My glasses were rose-colored when I looked north of the border, because I was lonely from home, and I, had, I was thinking of Canada very much as um, uh, it's in terms of warm democracy, and I realized that I needed to have a dose of reality there. And it hit the news even in Iowa when the, when the first year of these Canadian Excellence in Research Chairs program when the first round of uh, appointees were made that they appointed 19 men across the country and no women. Um, and I felt such shame. <laughs> uh, but one of the things, again, that happened is after this, a large, there was a significant and important and um, honorable brouhaha. And, the, and now is the case that with, these, with the new appointments of these Canadian Excellence in Research Chairs, the, the institutions um, are required to demonstrate that they perform good search practices. And so there's hope that, that these institutions will improve as well. <clears throat> um, one thing that comes up, the question that I'm very interested in is why is it that these patterns matter? And one of the things I hinted at earlier is that um, epistemology can provide us a, a way to answer this kind of question. Um, and in fact, you can think of this as being a founding, one of the founding questions of feminist epistemology. Uh, so, it's always hard to point to beginnings of fields, but this paper is often pointed to as being the beginning of the discipline. Lorraine Code's question, why, and I'm, I'm now going to, to uh, pretend to be Lorraine Code and not be nearly as eloquent, but um, so we can imagine her asking this question, or this question, why, is, why does these patterns of exclusion matter from the perspective that she would take in this paper? And the answer there is going to be that, of course, if it, if who the, if it makes a difference who the who the knower is, right, in terms of the knowledge being produced, then obviously the, the arbitrary exclusion of vast groups of knowers from our knowledge groups and communities is a problem. And um, what uh, Lorraine helped us focus on was the relationship of knowing subjects, the relationships of knowing subjects to one another, the relationship of knowing subjects to uh, the the what we know in the world, and in a way that is paying close and deep attention to our social and our material context. The other general theme that comes up um, is one of situated knowledge, and you see this theme weaving its way through feminist epistemology. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's so brainy. So that's a picture of Donna Haraway, and I chose that one because of the puppy. But, um, <laughs> but, that, but the term situated knowledge, I think, is one that we can identify identify with Donna Haraway, but has become part of the commonplace in our, in when we think about feminism and knowledge production. Uh, and so we see this weaving through people who are, the notion of situated knowledge, weaving through people who are looking at this work from a postmodern perspective, from an empiricist perspective, from a uh, Marxist perspective. It just, it's, a, it's a concept that has become really fundamental. And here's just a simple way of thinking about this in, in the level of individual people, is that what we know and how we know it reflects our social and material location. So again, it's the question that the position of the subject matters. We can also think of this at a, at a social level, which is where I tend to spend my time uh, thinking. And here, again, we can think that the organization of our research communities impacts the knowledge that those research communities can produce. And, there's, and here's what we think about the, the notion that the diversity, that diverse communities or communities that are structured along diverse and democratic lines um, facilitate the production of excellent science. And I'm using the word facilitate in a deliberately vague way here because there are many kinds of arguments that one could make. Um, I spend most of my time, um, I spend most of my time 
most of the talks I would give would just be on this one slide. And today I'm trying to, to um, give a more a broader overview. And so if we think about, and so we can think about one of the benefits that comes from diversity in communities, we can look at the addition, uh, a case study that I love is looking at the addition of women and feminist research into primatology in the 1970s and the impact that that increase in diversity had on the knowledge and the methods and the practices of those communities. Um, and here we can think of diversity as facilitating the creation of new hypotheses, uh, the work that I like the best here, and these are probably, um, I spend my time in the philosophy department, but I mean, these are core women's studies kinds of texts. There's the work of, by uh, Sarah Hurdy, who's a Darwinian feminist or a feminist sociobiologist, which most people think, how could one be that? But she does it very well, excuse me. Um, and so what Hurdy is, uh, the, the example that I use here is that she was looking at um, how Darwinian, Darwinian theory, particularly as it's been described and used in terms of sexual selection, in conjunction with the Victorian social values that have surprisingly lasted for a long time, or unfortunately lasted for a long time, um, really did, uh, really predicted, predicted that female, when it comes to reproduction, that of course females would be coy and sexually uh, reticent. And this, of course, and Hardy points out that this really deep uh, assumption harmed studies of female sexuality for a long time. And part of what was going on there is that it became it became, uh, the way she puts it, almost impossible to ask questions or gather data. Given these constraints, it became almost impossible to ask questions or gather data or pay attention to what she points out in her work with, uh, with Gloria's event and all of the randy female primates out there in the world and the behavior that was simply not being observed. And one of the things that she points out is if we look at that women in this case makes a difference, the influx of women into the field allowed them to, uh, in the perspective that they brought, allowed them to ask new questions, allowed them that, that pushed the bounds of the existing theoretical resources, and allowed them to, act, to do creative and interesting work on uh, female sexuality, in particularly, in particularly exploring what could be a, a wide range of hypotheses on the very possibility of, as well as explanations for, females engaging in non-reproductive sex. I'm like, thank you, Sarah Hurdy. Um, and so here's, here's where we have new hypotheses being formed because of this, because the arising from the addition of this new standpoint. We can also think of this in a methodological sense, and here I'm thinking in particular of this example of Donna Haraway's work on um, Jean Altman. Uh, Jean Altman has become one of my one of my heroes. So Jean Altman was a primatologist um, who, when she entered, she entered the field. She was uh, just, and she entered the field bringing consciously her her work, uh, her um, her perspective as being sort of a member of women's liberate women's liberation work in the 1970s and the early late 1960s. Her perspective as a woman, as a feminist, and as a mother to her research and realizing that there were observations <coughs> that weren't being made. And again, we do not have the methodological resources to observe the kinds of things that we needed to do that would to pay attention to female primates in particular, some of what's going on with issues of motherhood. Um, and so Jean Altman wrote a beautiful paper that she spent a lot of time on that was a that has become um, that is a methodological masterpiece. In this this paper so far has been cited more than six thousand times and it's undersided because the method that she pushes in this paper when I was an undergraduate at the University of Saskatchewan, I was a biology major, and animal behavior was one of my very favorite classes. And I didn't realize until I was in graduate school that the methods we were learning were with what Jean, what Jean Allman told us to learn. So it was a very undersided paper. And what's important about the methodology that she produced is that, that, she, that she supported, that she advanced in this particular paper, is that it was a methodology that we, she was pushed because it was something that could allow us to systematically observe um, the sort of low drama behavior of many female primates. But in fact, it's become sort of standard methods for, for, for biologists who are studying um, behavior related to sex and gender, and behavior that's not related to sex and gender, simply top methods in the field. Um, so those are arguing from examples in those particular cases. We can also look at, and this is where I spend most of my time actually, right there. Um, so we'll pay me to talk about it in two minutes. <clears throat> but there's also significant work in feminist epistemology that we do is more rigorous, and by more rigorous, we mean more objective or better justified science when that science is performed by diverse communities. And the nutshell of the argument there um, can be based on sort of the common sense idea that we do a better job of evaluating our work when we bring different sets of eyes to the problem. And so the notion here is that 
is that we are never in a position individually to be aware of all of the assumptions that we bring to um, our, to the methods that we apply, and in particular, the relation, our knowledge, our confidence that our data actually supports the hypothesis that we're working on, and the way that we can, um, and the way that the sort of the best method that we can use to figure out to identify particularly what those values might be is to um, be in a community in with, with people who have different experiences, different perspectives, and different values. And it's in that, in that democratic dialogue and discussion, uh, critical discussion, that we can come to see our value judgments. This is something that has been, um, this sort of set of ideas has been something that's been important to me for a long time. So when I first started doing work on feminist, mm -hmm. feminism and biology, I was struck by sort of what I would call the uh, parade of the absurd or the parade of the horribles, where if you look at sexism and racism that is in the core of biological research for so long, and part of what struck me is that these are scientists who are using the best practices of their time um, and coming up with results that are, in, that are value laden to the point where, from some perspectives that we hold right now, they're laughable. And it, I didn't know, um, I didn't want to assume that they were evil and I didn't want to assume that they were stupid. I didn't want to assume that the science was bad. And so how is it then that we can explain these, the, how is it that we can explain this parade of the horribles without those things? And so one way that we can explain that is if we look at the, hom the homogeneity of the community and how easy it is to not notice things that the group, when the group is to me, hom homogenous, that's the word, uh, in, that, in that perspective. Um, and so there's a notion George Lorber talked about noticing gender like is like being a fish noticing water. And so a fish notices water when it's out. <clears throat> Finally, um, well there's two more, but also there's roles Naomi Sheeman has done in one of my favorite papers on epistemology resuscitated, has done some amazing work looking at the in order for some, that really the job of science is to produce epistemically to produce trustworthy knowledge. And so in order and think, so what is it for scientific communities to deserve the trust of various members, different members of the public? And so one of the things, so she talks about that it's important not only from an ethical perspective, but from a very practical, epistemic perspective for these communities to be trustworthy. And to put it bluntly, um, why would I trust a community that doesn't respect to have my interests in mind when it doesn't respect me enough to have me be a member? And so in this case, issues of employment equity um, become something that's central from the scientific perspective. Heidi Grasswick has also done important, is also working on important work here. And we can use that, we can think about trustworthiness in terms of how should we trust them, but also if someone is doing scientific research or technological research with the goal of that research being, um, with the goal of that research being to make a difference in the world in some way, it's right, to, use, to move people's hearts and minds, and the notion of being trustworthy, and, if, and for some research that's a fundamental motivation of scientists. We can think of it, well, we'll leave it at that. And so in order for that scientific knowledge to be pragmatic or user it to be used, right, it needs to be produced by institutions that the people who are, would be the users or the consumers of that knowledge, um, that they can rationally trust that the knowledge that they produce is something that is in their interest or that is an accurate representation from the world from the property perspectives. And we could go on and on here. Um, but the point of this is just to give an overview of the different kinds of arguments that get made um, from a philosophical perspective of why diversity is important for science, not just from an ethical perspective, but from, a, um, but from an epistemic perspective. Um, someone who is selfish and just wants to be in the best darn department right, should be paying attention to these kinds of issues of diversity. Now, um, I don't want to, oftentimes when I give these talks, people will say, but why are you not focusing on the, uh, on the ethical issues, on the justice issues? And of course, I don't want to push those issues to the side. But what I found is that sometimes those issues um, don't motivate the way they might. And so I'm interested in looking at a variety of different kinds of motivations. And I'm also very interested in social epistemology. I'm interested in knowing how is it that we can make our communities better in terms of knowledge producing. And so I think this work for me is also valuable for its own sake. But I don't want to leave aside ethical and political games, right? The importance of employment, equity, and human rights, and as well the pedagogical um, sort of the pedagogical integrity of our institutions in terms of are we providing scientists as role models and teachers for a variety of kinds of people as opposed to for um, upper middle class white boys in our, in our classes. Um, and then also there are issues from an individual level when we think of things, there are issues where we think where 
we don't have to get all fancy, right? If we can think that there are that there are issues of implicit bias that are removing, um, that are hurting our consideration of people of color, men and women of color, and white women from our communities, what we're doing is shrinking our applicant pools. And even if we just want to make an argument that we want to find the best candidate ever, surely we would want to then open the open our pools as widely as we possibly can. Um, and the reason why I put this slide in here is that, so I do a lot of on-the-ground work uh, and training search committees and looking at policies. And one of the things you will find, or at least one of the things I have found widely, is that there's no one who will say, no, there shouldn't be diversity, right? Everybody will argue that this is a value. But then that value, when it is perceived as coming in conflict with other values, it goes awfully quickly. And um, one of the ways that it goes awfully quickly is, of course, diversity is important, but I have a duty to my institution to make sure we hire the best person. And, um, and that argument you see come up over and over again, and in which case then these last two slides, this one and this one, um, are ones that are important. <clears throat> so now what I want to do is sort of radically shift gears. So I'm talking, so this was sort of an overview in a big sweeping sense. Um, now I want to talk about uh, particular programs that are designed to improve diversity in our STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics communities. And one of these is the, the, the general program is the U.S. National Science Foundation Advanced Grant Program. Do people know about this? I know some do. Okay, uh, that's what I thought, which is good because then I have something to say as new. <laughs> so this is a program designed specifically to address gender equity um, and gender equity and attending to, and attending to equity in terms of white women and women of color in our STEM departments in, uh, in, our, in the academy. This program started in 2001 and it's still going on. Uh, so far they've spent more than $135 million um, on research projects and, and different strategies for changing the representation of uh, women in the academy. Uh, this is a small amount of money if we think about it in terms of the National Science Foundation budget. It's a huge amount of money if we think if we compare it to other kinds of programs designed to improve equity uh, in the academy. So far, uh, over 100 um, institutions of higher learning in the United States, including some nonprofit institutions in 41 different states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, have received these have uh, received these grants, and so it really has been a national kind of program. And I'll just skip over that last point. Those are just different kinds of grants that exist. Now the mandate of this program is to increase, and this is just quoting from the website of the National Science Foundation, which thank heavens finally opened again um, yesterday. <laughs> you couldn't even go to government web pages during the shutdown. They shut, yeah. Um, so the mandate here is to increase the representation and advancement of women in academic science and engineering careers, thereby, oops, there you go, contributing to the development of a more diverse um, science and engineering workforce. Interesting. So this is a program that was really came to the heart of things in the Bush years in the United States, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> and also maybe allows us to think to think um, critically in another way of current governments in Canada. Um, <clears throat> another thing we have going on here is that the mandate was to address various aspects of STEM academic culture and institutional structure that may differentially affect women faculty and academic administrators. Now what I find very interesting about this is this is actually very thoughtful because what we're saying here is we're not saying what we need to do is do a better job of training women. What we need to do is, um, and oftentimes one of the first things that happens from, an from a university perspective is that if women aren't succeeding, um, they don't say we blame the women, but the strategies always involve doing something to change the women. And so when this, this is something that's a very specific kind of program that's interested in looking at the culture and the institutional structures. And what is it about the very structure of our institutions that um, functions to exclude some people on arbitrary measures? And so the notion here is how do we change the institution to be more inclusive, um, which is, I think, a, which is more radical than possibly some of these people notice and much more radical than I think a lot of uh, university administrators sometimes think of. Um, because again, it's looking at Really, it's attending to issues of systemic uh, racism and systemic sexism, and it's looking at looking at the institutions that we succeed in, especially if we look at senior administrators. That those in, that that they that our institutions were designed in some ways to help a certain kind of person succeed, and oftentimes, right now, it is that certain kind of 
person who is required to do the changing in our institutions, and that's a very challenging position to be in. When we think about these advanced projects, the instructions are daunting. So if you want one of these grants, this is what you have to propose, a comprehensive institution-wide project in order to transform institutional practices and transform institutional culture, and the project has to be based in social science literature. Holy smokes, can you imagine? Um, and so what's fascinating is, for me, is if we look at that particular set of instructions, what does that imply about the research program that, is, that, um, that we need to develop to, to have any hope of fulfilling those? And what we see is that is again, another kind of diversity, another kind of heterogeneity. This requires that, we re that universities employ heterogeneous resources that cut across boundaries, cut across faculties, cut across departments, cut through university hierarchies, this is all very violent, isn't it? <laughs> that cross institutions and all of this time focusing on issues of gender. Uh, again, something that, and so when you think about what, what are the characteristics of a research program, of a change program that could do something like that, and the characteristics, it's, fun, it's one of the things that you'll notice is that in these research grants, um, you don't see feminism written very much, right? You don't see feminist structures on the National Science Foundation webpage. Um, and you don't see women's studies in a lot of these places. But almost all of these grants right, have, uh, are obviously women's studies projects or critical race theory projects because they have to be. And so if we look at these different kinds of diversity, we can see how they have to be. So first of all, surprise, surprise, it requires a cross-disciplinary approach um, because we're applying, in the basic sense, because we're applying a social science methodology to the institution in which that methodology is practiced. And so what ends up happening is that there are a range of science of uh, STEM people involved for issues of buy-in. Oftentimes these grants will have a group of co-PIs that will include a, so a sociologist, a psychologist, sometimes a philosopher, as well as uh, a group of maybe, I don't know, sometimes two to four mm -hmm. senior women scientists who are really pissed off at the, their experiences in the structure of their institution. And so what you end up having are collaborations <coughs> between people with wide different kinds of experiential background and very much different kinds of expertise. And you think, well, who is trained to do that? That's a women's studies project, right? Almost by definition, it, or it would be a paradigm issue of what women's studies is about. Also, it's the kind of thing that focuses on multiple levels of organization. If you think about these kinds of projects, what we are interested in is individual people, and so sometimes we'll be interviewing an individual person. Uh, sometimes then you pan back and you look at relationships within a department and what are the power structures in departments. Sometimes then you pan back again and you look at how university policy impacts these different kinds of things. And all of this is done from a theoretical perspective. And so if it's a research program that requires a microscope and a fisheye lens and being able to switch between them with great facility, which again is something that is a women's studies kind of project. Um, also these things tend to um, encompass the university hierarchy. So for example, a lot of these programs require training department chairs when it comes to like, how to run a good search, training department chairs on issues of bias. And how on earth do you get all of the club department chairs in your faculty to come sit and listen to me talk to them about feminism for three hours in an afternoon? <laughs> well, let me tell you how you do it, right? You send the invitation from the same person who gets to decide whether or not they get any hires next year. So almost, <laughs> so these grants almost, the PI on these grants almost always tends to be a provost, an associate provost, a president, or a dean who's got a lot of clout in the university. Um, oftentimes, the, the PI for these projects has no background whatsoever in diversity kinds of issues, right? But what they give, what they bring to the project, is power, authority, and again, accountability. So, and it's the, and, um, okay. And the next thing is, it includes several kinds of work. So oftentimes, if you think about what does it take to, to change an institution, we need, to, we need to study the institution, and so you'll see work involved in um, oftentimes work with uh, institutional planning and analysis or institutional research, whatever the name of that is, who gives you your demographic data. You have, and so there's crossovers, there's crossovers there, there's basic research that gets done. Um, also, there's a lot of times where, again, if I'm gonna sit and, if I'm gonna spend my time putting together a workshop to train a group of department chairs, where does that fit on my vita? That's service. And so oftentimes what you see is that these projects cross outreach, research, and service, and it's a challenge to think about how does this fit into the everyday academic's life. 
And again, this is something else. It's just seemed, when I was thinking about this in, um, a few weeks ago, I was just thinking it's, well, of course they're all, there's these, these projects are full of women's studies people, because this is the kind of work that women's studies has the capacity to do. <clears throat> Another final point that I want to make is, um, oops, hang on. Oh, I talked through this slide as I went through the, as I went through the first one. So the other kind of issue that I find uh, particularly fascinating here is issues of, of reflexivity. And so if you think about what has to happen, you've got now in, with this program, universities across the United States um, taking the theoretical, the methodological, and the leadership resources that already exist on campus and somehow harnessing those resources to create a research project but it's not a research project that's researching out, right? It's a kind that sort of fits loosely with issues of maybe participatory research or action research, but it's taking our, our research resources and, and turning them in on ourselves and looking at how is it that we are, how do we function as a knowledge producing community? How do we fulfill our obligations to the greater public and to member, our members of that community? Um, and this notion of a research program that is a mirror on its own institution, again, if we look at feminist epistemologists ranging from uh, Sandra Harding through Lorraine Code through sort of all of the, so we think of like the, the one of the early names in feminist epistemology, well that's what's happening is this great push on reflexivity. And here we have reflexivity happening at an institutional level um, with the support of the federal government. So now what I'd like to do is to talk to you about the advanced grant, how are we doing? To talk to you about the advanced grant that I was part of at Iowa State University. So to look at this not at the national perspective, but to look at a particular example of how this played itself out. Oh, before I go, I do want to talk a little bit about changes in that program over time because there has been a formative evaluation at the national level of the advanced program. And when folks were starting out with this program, they didn't, um, no one knew how to do this kind of research well. And so part of what happens, of course, if you're an academic, is you study everything, including how well you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so over time, there have been more stringent requirements for research, for the research program. So initially, that notion that you had to use a social science research um, method was not in the instructions. And it quickly became apparent that there had to be appropriate theoretical and methodological grounding for these projects to work. Um, also, stronger, how do we know these projects are successful in the end? Um, they're initially, and so there, there was a requirement for there to be much stricter formative and summative assessment plans so that we could see how we were doing with our projects. And the most important thing is the initial sort of rounds of these projects tended to do what affirmative action has done uh, for women for a long time, which is primarily help women to look a lot like me, right? And that don't mean wearing glasses here, right? And so, um, and so there has been a much stronger uh, set of requirements that institutions look particularly at issues affecting women of color and women of a variety of other, uh, uh, who are marginalized in a variety of other ways. And one of the, and again, that's, that's a real challenge for some institutions. And one of the results of that has been a distribution of some of these grants to traditionally black colleges in the states, um, to uh, colleges and research programs that focus on Aboriginal peoples, um, which has been, which again, I think is something that's very interesting and important, and something that we, a lesson that we should carefully take from some of these projects. Okay, now my project. Our it was it was a team, but I feel very proud of what we did here. So this was a um, three and a half million dollar grant that we held between 2006 and 2011. Um, our goal was to improve the recruitment, retention, advancement of women faculty, straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> at that point, um, at that point, Iowa State University was behind the curve when it came to uh, comparing to our peer institutions and the representation of women, particularly when it came to women in leadership positions women in the, com in the committees that make a difference, women in dean's offices, women in central administration, as well as actually women full professors. Um, <clears throat> we'll just skip that one. So this sort of describes the project that we did um, in, in terms of how does it get to be comprehensive. Well, we put together a top-down mm -hmm. approach that focused, that was ran through the provost office that focused on policy change and institutional data gathering um, and bottom-up approach, which involved interventions in particular departments designed to improve the culture of those kind of departments. And so we're really doing a, a project that, that's, that's the sign for the project. <laughs> now, and so one of the things you can, that we can see is that, the, so we worked in particular departments. Those departments are in faculties, college, colleges in the states. 
So from the provost office, we, wor we worked on policy change, we worked on education in that conference, uh, we worked on um, faculty satisfaction surveys, looking at gender differences, race differences, um, and they were st surprising and stark, in ranging from like, how much stress do you feel at your job to how included do you feel in networks to um, what are your intentions to stay. And uh, these surveys provided uh, ample um, motivation for top administrators to get involved in this kind of project. And also, to be developed, we did a lot of education where we hired someone in the provost office every term to work on a project. And one of the projects that worked best were search strategy resources. Those resources are now institutionalized in the provost office at Iowa State University. And they're pretty good. I mean, so if you're thinking about looking at how to do equitable searches, there are various advanced institutions, but these, these ones, um, it's, it's useful useful resources for everything from questions you can't ask in an interview to how to assess candidates to how to minimize implicit bias, what have you. At the level of the colleges, um, we had three colleges involved in this project, our College of Engineering, College of Arts and Science, and College of Agriculture and Life Science. At each college, we hired an equity advisor. This is someone who um, was a go-between kind of person. We spent, they were, they were a respected senior scientist within that college and we trained them like crazy when it came to gender. What is gender? How can a university be gender? Uh, we trained them like crazy when it came to issues of stereotype threat, implicit bias, how to run a search, how to talk about these things. And these are people who already had credibility and authority both in the eyes of the dean and in the eyes of the department chairs. And so they helped to coordinate events. Um, they were our go-betweens with the department deans and with the department chairs because in fact even though we knew the literature better than they did, they had the position of being authority, of authoritative and uh, good change agents. Um, these people did a lot of college-wide coordination, managed chair training, managed campus-wide training workshops, and then of course we did work in departments, um, and that was that was the the funnest, that was the most fun of, of the entire thing because it's working transforming different kinds of cultures. So if we think about this in terms of cross-disciplinarity, again, we've got uh, researchers in um, the research team, which was us, uh, ranging in the social sciences and humanities, our advanced professors and our equity advisors, as well as the departments that we worked with were all science people, mostly men. Um, and uh, so we've got lots of that. In terms of focusing on different levels of organization, I'll talk about that one a bit in the next slide. Encompassing university hierarchy, so we had an associate provost and a provost be the PI for this grant, um, all the way down to. I just when I first when I started working on this, I was a lot younger, and I just thought it was I was amused because I would go in with my ponytail and the very expensive suit that I invested in, I invested in buying for this process. Um, where'd it go? Oh. Um, and so the issue of I was walking in and my credentials were I was a feminist philosopher and I was a woman and I was young uh, going in to try and explain to a bunch of department chairs how they had been hiring wrong <laughs> for their entire careers. Um, and so we really did think about the top, the top of the hierarchy all the way down to in this in a science technology university at the bottom from a faculty perspective. Um, and in terms of different kinds of work, again, a lot of the, anytime you see workshops or training or campus-wide, that's something that fits mostly, those are a lot, that's a lot of work that fits in the service category uh, on Avia and can be extremely challenging when it comes to how, do, how does this kind of work, doing this kind of work, impact the careers of the researchers and other people involved. So if we think about the research part of this project focused in particular departments, um, we had nine focal departments in three colleges. We trained a senior faculty member who we called an advanced professor and we bought up their courses so they could do this kind of work in each department and they led the research program in their department um, along as a team. So I worked specifically with three departments and so I teamed up with three different advanced professors to work to study the climate in these various departments. Now, <clears throat> this is the collaborative transformation or the research part of things. And so again, you've got the advanced professor and team. What we did in every department was break it down into focus groups by rank and individual interviews of people who wanted them. From those focus groups, then I wrote, I did a qualitative analysis of that data and wrote up a report of the various themes that we found that was basically a mirror to the department. And there's nothing, we didn't surprise them because we were telling them things that they told us. Along with basically a menu of suggestions. And so there might be nine problems in this department. And so if you have challenges with mentoring, you might try A, B, C, or D, right? A bunch of suggestions there. 
their interventions, and that then the advanced professor and the team of the committee that, that he put together in his department then decide, okay, what do we want to try in our department? And so then the advanced professors work to implement whatever they chose to from those things. And then my role ended up being like the quiet person in the background to he could come to and ask questions and offer different kinds of support. And the support that we offered to the departments ranged from you know, lasting for one year to three years. So there was a lot of time spent there. But this slide I really put up because um, our goal was to change culture. And if we think of culture as being relationships between norms and structures and practices, norms are value judgments, structures, how our workplace is organized, practices, what we do on a daily basis. This is a sociological framework of, and it explains why it's so difficult to change, or it's one way of thinking about why it's so difficult to change culture. Because imagine an administrator who wants to implement a paternal, uh, a parental leave policy, which we did not have at that university, and if you want in the United States, it's, it's nice to be home, let's put it that way. And so you can imagine, you can imagine norms where the, the norms in a department are such that the, the faculty need to be dedicated, need to be there a lot, and that there's a lot of face time that's required, and that's what demonstrates that you care about your work. Um, and practices in the department, it might be the case that there's a, this policy gets announced and you've got people chatting around the water cooler saying, well, I don't know that anyone would do that. That doesn't seem fair to me if they could have time off and my kids couldn't. I can have time off and my kids. Or if someone's going to take time off, how do we know they care about their science if they're willing to take off a whole semester for a baby? Um, <laughs> which then, and so in those kinds of situations where you have value judgments and practice related together, you can imagine a new faculty, junior faculty member, pre-tenure, in this kind of environment, it's like you have to have rocks in your head to actually make use of this policy, no matter how good that policy is. And so as a result, that policy doesn't become part of the structure of the department. And so this, what we were trying to do with reports was provide a mirror where people could see um, the relationships and, and see the consequences of their norms or the practices or their structures. If you look at them integrate together, the different consequences those have and people are positioned differently within the department. Um, and so when we're talking about what made this, this strategy so effective, because it really was, and there's interesting, so part of it was looking at the, the, the sociological perspective here, uh, going from there to the psychological perspective of what happened during those focus groups, and you have people talking about issues of uh, whether or not their department seems like a home to them in front of other people who haven't had these discussions. So this focusing back and forth between the tight psychology of what's happening in those focus groups to the sociological perspective of what is the structure of the department and going back and forth between them was one of the things that facilitated the success of this kind of approach. And again, and it's no surprise that all of the research here in this program were affiliated with the Women's Studies program um, and have facility in, make, in making those kinds of changes and moves. Um, finally, with this project, we talk about a little bit about institutionalization and involvement, and a lot of what's going on here has to do with researchers. So originally, there was a team of four to six of us, people came and left, who are the co-PIs for this project. We then expanded with extensive training. By the end of the project, the people who were the equity advisors in the colleges and the advanced professors in the various departments we looked at were incredibly well trained um, to the point where they could write papers, uh, based academic papers on some of these kinds of issues. Um, and then we moved from there to training the deans and the chairs, and then finally outreach to the faculty. And by the end of this project, we had put together a network of about 450 professors from across the university. And that's, and one of the, and that's one of the reasons why the bottom up is so important, because administrators can come and go, and you can often, you mean, all have experience, as I imagine, when a new administrator comes and then there's like a new boss, new set of practices, the things that you've worked on so hard for the last three years all of a sudden aren't important anymore. And so there's a lot of uh, change that can happen in that perspective. But on the other hand, if we can think about impacting the culture of, our, of where we do our work, departments are important because that's where we go to work. Um, impacting culture at that level is something that can have much more staying power over time, especially if people are trained to be self-conscious about what they're, how, what they're doing, how they do their work impacts that culture. And the changes that we've had are things that impact everybody because what ends up happening is you have a more open, more transparent, um, more closely networked workplace with happier employees. And so what happens is job satisfaction among white people and people of color, among men and women, all went up, right? And so what that meant is then people became invested in making sure that their place of work was a place where they could be happy to go to in the morning. Um, <clears throat> And so if we look at various successes for this program, one of the big challenges was that 2008 came in the middle of our grant cycle. 
And so if we're looking at changing recruiting practices, you can't study that in the German hiring freeze. Um, but what we found is our preliminary survey data, survey data showed that um, showed improvements in uh, job satisfaction and has showed more significant improvements in departments where we work, where we work, that we work with as focal departments than other departments. Um, we care very carefully at all the departments we worked with, we did very, we kept the interview over and over again. And so I was on the side as a support, but I was also taking notes of what was going on in that department over from like one to three years. And so we have all kinds of qualitative data of documenting changes in culture in these programs. Uh, we found in within departments changes in parental leave practices, distributions of teaching loads, mentoring in departments, implementation of family friendly policies in departments. And finally, we saw significant changes in university level policy that actually, and policies were we actually that were used, and we had business arguments that showed that it was actually the university saved money by investing money in family friendly policies. So, in some ways, it was a very successful program. So now I want to pan out again, right, in women's studies fashion, and think about the, con the point of today's conference. We think about the impact of feminism on the 21st century academy. First of all, it matters that science is by the people. Um, it matters uh, ethically, it matters politically, it matters in terms of the quality of the science that we produce. And there have been um, organizations and institutions that have tried to make concrete changes along those lines. So we think about the National Science, Advanced, National Science Foundation Advanced Program was a significant investment in time, people's time, money, resources in, issue, in looking at this program. And then I looked at Iowa State as a very particular example of this. And one of the things that struck me was the, when I was thinking about these programs and was really motivated by writing this talk was the sort of rich importance of women's studies in uh, helping us to understand and improve the academy, not just in, and again, improve the academy not just in terms of um, in terms of making it a more just place, but making it a place where we do our jobs better and where we can better serve the public who pays our bills. So thank you. Thank you, Carla, for setting the stage for a much broader discussion of this issue. Uh, and Carla uh, has uh, agreed to answer questions, and we'll extend the question period, I think, to about 11.10. I'll just point out that because uh, this conference is not only uh, being podcasted, it's being webcast, so we may receive questions from the universe. And we have, <laughs> we've got <laughs> in the next 20 minutes. Uh, and we have great tech support today. Ruben, who's taping it, and Matthew, who's sitting there at the laptop, will raise his hand if there's a question from the universe. And I won't interrupt us, but uh, it is important that we uh, broaden our discussion as widely as we possibly can, which was behind our decision to do that. So we will probably uh, run until about 11.10. All right, the rest of you. Uh, and the other point is that Helen is, is holding a microphone uh, and uh, we'll bring it to you. You raise your hand to ask the question of Carla. Your turn. Let me, oh, good to <coughs> Has the advanced program made any impact on the hiring of women into academia, their promotion, their tenuring, and ultimately their nomination to the Royal Society. So I don't know about the last question. And um, one of the things that's starting to happen now is that there are advanced grants that are looking at doing meta-analyses of the impacts of these programs, not just and the, impact, the impact not just of individual grant programs, but the impact of the entire National Science Foundation program. So I, mean, I can speak to specifically to our program that we ran. Um, and one of the things that we found, for example, was that um, there were a lot of women associate professors. And, the, and so we found it very important to pay attention to the amount of time that someone spends in the associate rank and understand what kind of mentoring it takes to encourage someone to move from associate to full. 
Uh, and that was one of our one of our analyses that we spent a year focusing on, uh, and where we made a significant difference. Other ways that we made that we made differences is that we could see the university. If you put up a, a picture of the university provost office deans and associate deans, it was a very um, uh, it was a very homogeneous group of people. Let's just put it that way. And by the time we ended, we had an impact not only in hiring practices for um, for new faculty being hired, but also had diversity questions that were institutionalized as, as sort of part of the, of, the, of the interviews and the public questions asked, asked of all new dean candidates and all new upper administrators. And one of the things that ended up happening is we now, then now have a very diverse set of leaders in the university. So we've seen increases in full professors, increases in uh, diversity in the top leadership of the university. Also, we started paying very close attention to, and this this is a basic succession planning that any university needs to needs to think about. Um, started paying attention to who were members of committees that tended to um, member had who had positions who were members of committees that tended to rise to other kinds of leadership levels. And so, one of the things that we find is that oftentimes there were patterns that women in departments tended to be directors of undergraduate studies, not directors of graduate studies. Right, who is the person who is often who's up to chair as director of graduate studies? And so paying attention to who, to community committee leadership. Similarly, um, who provides leadership in terms of college-wide or faculty-wide promotion and tenure committees? And who is spending time doing work, doing committee work that you could think of as institutional housekeeping that keeps committee that keeps the university running, but is very invisible work and tends to not contribute to someone's promotion, as opposed to who spends time doing work that um, that we see as that that university leadership sees as being public and visible and grooming someone for an administrative position. And so that's another place where we made a difference. And it's a and that's not a very difficult thing to do once you once you think about it in terms of implementing in different kinds of places. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm curious the four hundred and fifty people in the network, what proportion of the faculty and administration that constituted, and also whether the, the changes were starting to happen at the level of attitude as well, because it's fine to change practices, and I mean, it sounds like it's on its way to being a successful program, but attitude, you know, do, were people taking this on the grudgingly, or that were there significant changes in in the way um, people were approaching their colleagues? Was it becoming a conversation around the water cooler at the mailbox type thing? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, so five years on the one hand, it seemed when we first got it seemed like a long time, and then we got an extra year, so six years <coughs> forever. But if we think about hiring cycles and changing how people think, it's just it's just this big. Right? Uh, and but one of the things, so we implemented our program in steps, and so the first group of people, we were very. I mean, we didn't. I'm thinking now about the departments that we worked with in particular, and the first set of training workshops that we did. There was a lot of pressure for those first set of training workshops to be really, really good. Um, and part of the reason for that is that we knew that if we came in and, and you know, there, there could be no learning curve. Because if the first one wasn't good, then department chairs and senior people talked to and no one, and that would be it. Um, and so part of it was being aware of this challenge from the beginning with those kinds of issues. Um, one of the things that happened, which I thought was, we were concerned about who would be our focal departments. Like, would anybody agree to do this, to come in? And we ended up having participation rates in our focal departments being about, I think it was 73%, um, up and down in different ones, which is really, really high. Part of that came from the fact that they, that we had top leadership supporting us. For the first round of focal departments, everybody was afraid. They walked into their focus group meetings not knowing what was going to happen. Was it going to be um, uh, where they could be called to rat out their colleagues? Was it going to be like a bitch session? And, and in fact, that wasn't the case at all. Uh, we didn't ask them what gender at all, right? We asked them, what about your department makes it a good place for you to work? And what about your department makes it a bad place for you to work? And we noticed the differences in the answers from different kinds of people. And so the first round of focal departments were sort of were a little bit reticent. But after that first round, people started talking. And by the time and we added three next year and three the year after that, 
And by the time the last year came, we had people who were really angry that their department wasn't included. We didn't have the resources. <laughs> um, and so part of what was going on was we were very careful to use appreciative inquiry, right? And we were very careful to never present a problem without a selection of, res of um, possible responses to that problem. And we had set things up so that there was pressure from the university administration to change. And so we could come in and then say, you have this pressure to change, we can help you with that. And these, so these things, um, and in general, like, in, in general, so by the end, the participants, I think, were very keen. At the beginning, they were very worried. And because we were worried about that, we just worked really hard at the beginning to make sure that it started correctly. Um, and again, so that was, the size of the faculty has been changing, but that's like a quarter to a third of the professors on campus who ended up being in some way involved in this program, and that's a lot. Um, the other thing was we very carefully picked out change agents in departments, so we found people who were, this was the individual thing, right? We found people who were on our side and who already had authority and were already well-liked and trained them and provided incredible support for them. And so the equity advisors and the advanced professors actually had a very big role. And one of the things we did is then we would then fold in people who had successfully been part of one year into the project for the next year to sort of help people get along. And so I think that I think there were significant changes over time, um, more than I thought there would be. We have a question from the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is from the Twitter feed. So we have a question uh, asking, given the systemic problems in higher education, how do you suggest a catalyst type program be applied in Canada? I think that Canadian universities have incredible resources to pair, right? We've got, I mean, here we have an excellent women's studies program um, at Western, and the other thing that we can think of, so I think, I think that what's stopping us from doing things like this in Canada is that things like this in Canada aren't being funded. I think that's the short answer to that question. Um, and I think also, when I think of like, iconic Canadian values, it fits so well. If we think of plurality and inclusion and participation, that um, I feel like that there's that this is the sort of thing that should flourish here. And there are people who are doing small projects here and there. We do have, for example, if we look at the successes in changing the CRC and the, and the CERC programs, if we look at NSERC has uh, uh, research chairs for women in engineering, so there have been uh, initiatives, but what's lacking is the is the leadership for some sort of for systematic analysis of this kind of, in this kind of way. Um, I wanted you to go back to what you were talking about in terms of the changes and kind of trajectory of change that occurred when you were working with it, because I guess my concern is is that the focus of the program is is, is this introduction of gender and diversi diversification, right? Genderization and diversification through steps. Um, and doing it in such a stealthy way, does it in, in the long run undermine your project or by the end of the project did the people in these departments realize that they were dealing with questions of gender and diversity? Yeah, um, so this was, so you can imagine the six of us, right, who are getting this thing going. There's the conversation that we would have with our suits on and then there's the conversation after two glasses of wine in the evening. Um, and part of the challenge Part of the challenge there was that, so you, there were some people who were up to date on issues of intersectionality and who were up to date on issues of gender and who sort of had humanities and social science backgrounds in these areas. But these people often weren't even our partners who were involved, like the, the people from physics and from biology, like the senior women faculty members in those positions. And so there was tension in terms of it being stealth or not, even in that position. Right, and that was a very that was a very um, that relation keeping that relationship working took a lot of took a lot of effort. Um, in terms of it being a stealth program, I mean, we did we thought about this a lot. Can we can we call it a feminist program on campus? And we didn't. We didn't even. Oftentimes, we didn't even use the word diversity on campus. Right? We used issue. We used words like leadership development. Um, and you know, and by and because it, nobody. It, lots of people didn't want to be taught. Um, but on the other hand, what worked really well is people are willing to pay attention to, especially in a STEM university, you're willing to pay attention to data, right? And so if you can have a graph where you can show that the attrition rates before tenure for women and men at your institution, using data from your institution, 
and being able to talk about those statistics in ways that scientists from a variety of disciplines can talk about. Sometimes you need to have error bars, sometimes you need to have confidence intervals, sometimes you, I mean, um, paying attention to that um, got people on our, on our side. And once, there, once that sort of credibility was established in terms of the data, then you could start talking politics. Um, but even so, the, it was, I still, I still feel conflicted about the whole the stuff project. And it became less stuffy as we went along, but not a whole lot. Another question? Um, more of a comment, really, but um, I didn't quite understand one of the uh, statements on one of your slides when you said Canadian and American university employment patterns are, sim are similar, because um, near the end of your talk, you talked about the awful parental leave policies, for example, um, and I would have to assume that uh, did you work in a unionized environment? No. So there's another big difference. I mean, um, academic. there are 57,000 academic staff in Canada. I know that because I'm a past president of CAET. So that makes a big difference for a number of reasons, I believe, in terms of what you're talking about. Not the least of which is that academic staff have access to governance procedures in universities like Senate committees that decide how many tenured faculty are we going to give to which departments next year? How many more? If you see what I mean. So that, I believe, is a significant issue in terms of what you're talking about. So when I was talking about similarity, all that I was talking about was the notion that you find more women in biology in Canada and in the United States. Okay. That you tend to find women in Canada and women in the United States um, segregated into these sort of less secure, less prestigious places in the cabinet. So that's all that I was referring to with that similarity there. Um, and in terms of, so I've spent, I've been in, I've, sort of, I've been affiliated with two Canadian universities and two American universities and have spent some time looking more broadly. Um, and so faculty governments is something that you see in uh, many American universities too, in terms of the kinds of, the sorts of things that you were talking about. Uh, Unionization, there are many more universities unionized here than in the States, but there are some. And so that's a difference that's a difference of degree rather than a difference of kind. Um, but I'm, I do want to be very careful about thinking of, another thing that's different is access to information. So we look at changes in the Canadian census, and that's a serious problem uh, in terms of us being able to get the data that we need, whereas the National Science Foundation um, has data that is, that is easily accessible to answer the kinds of questions that we're thinking. So there are important differences, and, and for me, I always feel sort of like as a Canadian who spent a lot of time in the States and has simply recently moved back home, I mean, I hear you in terms of the need to be careful about making assumptions that cross the border. I have a question at the back. I was wondering if you could say something about um, why you thought that feeling diversity as uh, excellence was a better motivator than seeing it as an ethical issue or an issue of, uh, of justice? What? Um, two things, and I don't know if it's better, but in my experience, um, I've had a lot of experience where, I, when I started doing this kind of work, what I thought is, I display the data, and people will be aghast, and will say, what can we do to fix things? And that didn't ever happen. Um, what happened is, I would display the data, and people were very good at saying, that data doesn't apply to us here, right? Uh, and let me explain to you why. And you get a bunch of professors in the room, and they're really good at coming up with explanations of why that doesn't apply to us. Um, which led me, that's actually what led me to be so interested in just talking about ignorance, right? Why, how is it that you're so good at not knowing these kinds of things? Especially when they're the kinds of things that we're trained actually to, like the kind of, this data, right? This, um, and so I found that, I found that it, and then the other thing that came up was that, there, is, there are deep assumptions that there, that there are, are a bunch of values that conflict, right? So the assumption that if I'm going to focus on hiring women or if I'm going to focus on hiring people of color, that means I'm sacrificing excellence. And, I, and you have people who would say, of course we want diversity, but we can't sacrifice excellence, right? That false dichotomy comes up over and over and over again. 
And so another thing that motivated me is I wanted to, th to think carefully about why that is just, why that's wrong. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's sad. I think that, and I think, I think it's important not to let the ethics arguments and the political arguments go, right? It's important. But I find that I want all the resources that I have at my disposal. And that the, the resources from the excellent side of things for a long time were under, uh, underdeveloped. Question? Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful talk. Um, I have a sort of a more general question, um, but I'm lucky enough to be a PhD student in the Women's Studies Department here, where I think female students are really supported and nurtured. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what young female academics can expect going out into the larger academic world in Canada, because um, I'm wholly unprepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's incredible diversity in terms of where a person lands. And so there, I have some girlfriends who, when I tell them my data and show them my stories, they're like, thank heavens I don't have that. So that's something that's important to notice. But, and so there's a piece of advice that I have, and that is, and it was an advice, a piece of advice that my women's studies mentor in graduate school gave to me, and I thought she was crazy. I didn't think she was crazy. I thought she was. I couldn't understand her reasoning for this, and I can now. Um, and she basically said to me that <clears throat> you need to get a job that's the right job for you, and it's better to not have a job than a job that's the right job for you. I thought, I have no money. What do you mean? It's better to have a job. Um, but one of the things that comes up if we look at issues of career success is to find departments where the climate is a supportive climate, and then it's worth. And in my mind, if I have a choice between a top institution and one an institution one or two down, and the top institution has a bad climate for women and a few institutions down have a good climate for women, better job there. Um, and oftentimes we don't focus on that. Uh, because a job where you don't have to spend your time and your energy dealing with uh, dealing with issues of sexism and racism, they're implicit or explicit, right? It's something where you have more time to do your work and more time to have a good life. Um, and, and the issue is you can't ask people, is the climate good, right? What you need to do is look for evidence like, have people use parental leave policies and come back to work and succeed in their career, right? Are there people from various marginal perspectives that are in this department and talk to them and are they happy? Um, find out not only who the department hires, but who leaves, right? Does the door revolve faster for people of color than for white people in that department? So in this case, there's, there's kinds of concrete data that you can look for that can demonstrate that it's a good place to be. Um, and so that's not a what can you expect, but it's a how to, do it, how to navigate, because better to land in one of those good places. One last question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so your advanced grant uh, and project has been really successful. So my question is about sort of what your next step would be if you were to implement the program here in Canada, say. So is there anything that stands out in your mind as something that you would definitely change or would definitely be your next step if you were to do this program again? Um, if we were to do the program again, especially, so when I look at my home institution now in Waterloo, there's a lot of racial and ethnic diversity in the university. And so the department, the program would have to be, as opposed to Iowa State, which was a great school, but I would sometimes teach classes there where all of my students were not, they weren't all white, they were all blonde, right? So it was a case where there wasn't that kind of diversity. And so the challenges and, and among the students or among the faculty. And so it was, and so one of the things that I would do differently is that I would be paying attention to and have the research program be uh, focusing on issues of race and ethnicity from the beginning, right? And in Canada in particular, right, when you think about what is the, what is the role of Aboriginal peoples in our institutions of higher learning and how, what is this about the structure of our institutions of higher learning that can make that a better place? So I think those are two really important things that I would do uh, differently here. And some of these things are happening. So I'm chair of the Status of Women and Equity Committee, which is a faculty association committee at Waterloo. And we've been working very hard with the administration to implement some of the best practices in hiring that have come up in a variety of ways, including from some of these advanced programs. And these best practices in hiring, one of the argument to make there is that they're best practices, period. So if we, have, if we hire in ways where we are being as inclusive as possible with regard to uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, right, what we're doing is that, that, that is not sacrificing excellence. What that's doing is reinforcing excellence. And so trying to look at how those things can be put in place. And those things, there are different universities in Canada that sort of different, are different places along that line. 
by working with administration, with faculty associations, and with staff about hiring practices. Thank you, Carolyn. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Hall.